We're going to continue with our reading When Protestants Argue Like Atheists by Trent Horn. Uh, the other book that I'll be going through is uh, still in the mail. I don't know when that's supposed to arrive, but should be good. Sometimes Protestant apologists will admit that certain Catholic doctrines are well attested in the writings of the Church Fathers, even though they think the doctrines are not taught in the Bible. That's nice of them. Hey, Eel, how's it going? Good evening. William Webster rejects baptismal regeneration as unbiblical, for example, but he acknowledges that, quote, the doctrine of baptism is one of the few teachings within Roman Catholicism for which it can be said that there is a universal consent of the fathers. Wow, that's very interesting. I would be curious as to his theory as to how the early church fathers could have universal consent on baptismal regeneration, but yet not understand scripture in that way. Norm Geisler and Ralph McKenzie admit that the early church believed that the apostles' teaching authority was preserved through successors, apostolic succession, but downplay this fact by claiming that, quote, simply because a teaching existed early in church history, that doesn't make it true. Well, that argument is certainly true. Um, the idea of premillennialism uh, was uh, indeed did circulate uh, among some of the early church fathers. Um, but uh, nevertheless, the, the church came to reject that view. So, I mean, yes, this, this is true. But the difference is, is that it was never formally taught. It never had universal consent. Uh, it was never officially taught as de definitive by the magisterium. Uh, it was never explained in an ecumenical council, so it doesn't really matter much to me. So the distinction is not whether or not it, you can find it there or not, but whether or not the manner in which one finds it. The universal consent of the fathers, that's, that's a pretty strong one. According to these same apologists, though, the absence of other Catholic doctrines in the writings of the Church Fathers proves those doctrines are false. One common example they cite is the bodily assumption of Mary into heaven. Webster says, quote, For centuries in the early Church, there was complete silence regarding Mary's end. And Geisler and Mackenzie claim the belief was, quote, not held by most of the early church fathers, end quote. These apologists are making arguments from silence against Catholicism. They say if Catholicism were true, then Doctrine X would be described in the writings of certain church fathers. But Doctrine X is not found among certain church fathers. Therefore, Catholicism is false. In doing so, they are arguing like atheists. For if you swap out Catholicism for Christianity, you can find identical arguments from silence claiming that major Christian doctrines must be unbiblical novelties because they are conspicuously absent from early Christian sources. This doesn't mean that Catholics and Protestants should never use arguments from silence. They can be valid. But we must be careful in defining when a mere lack of evidence becomes a deafening silence that casts serious doubt upon a belief. When Protestants set the bar too low in critiques of Catholic doctrine, they risk having to tolerate non-Christians using the same measure in their critiques of fundamental Christian doctrines. One example of an argument from silence against Christian doctrine comes from early 20th century liberal Protestants who doubted the historicity of the virgin birth. One of them, uh, Harry Fosdick, declared in a sermon entitled, Shall the Fundamentalist Win?, that, quote, two men who contributed most to the church's thought of the divine meaning of the Christ were Paul and John who never even 
distantly alluded to the virgin birth. The arguments can still be found among modern critical scholars such as Bart Ehrman, who says that the in Mark's gospel, quote, there is no word of Jesus' pre-existence or of his birth to a virgin. Surely, if this author believed in either view, he would have mentioned it, end quote. Arguments from silence are also popular among mythicists who say that Jesus never existed as a human being. They claim that the first Christians instead thought of Jesus as a cosmic savior figure who appeared in visions to them. Richard Carrier makes this point by citing the lack of details about Jesus' earthly ministry in Paul's writings. He says, quote, Never once is his baptism mentioned, or his ministry, or his trial, or any of his miracles, or any historical details about what he was like, what he did, or suffered, or where he was from or where he had been, or what people he knew. No memories from those who knew him are ever reported. Paul never mentions Galilee or Nazareth, or Pilate or Mary or Joseph, or any miracles Jesus did, or any miraculous powers he is supposed to have displayed. End quote. Remember that not all arguments from silence are faulty. One argument for an early date of the, apostle, the, the Acts of the Apostles thus rests on the fact that Acts does not record events like the deaths of Peter and Paul or the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem. These things aren't proof that Acts was written early, but it does make it more likely given that it would have been odd for a historian like Luke to omit such important events in his account of the apostolic church. The key to making successful argument from silence, though, lies in being able to show that if an event actually happened, it is highly likely an author would have written about it, and so his silence on the matter is evidence it didn't happen. The argument can't rest on it merely because of being possible or even fitting for an author to have written about a certain topic. For example, historians agree that Marco Polo went to China even though he never mentions the Great Wall of China in his travel diaries. The first century Jewish historian Josephus never mentions the writings of Paul, even though Paul was a Pharisee who became one of Christianity's leading theologians and so would have been infamous. infamous. Of course, these cases don't show that Paul's conversion of the Great Wall of China are myths. This is why the Protestant scholar Timothy McGrew says, quote, It is a risky business to speculate upon the motives of authors for including or omitting various facts, end quote. In another essay, McGrew provides a litany of strange historical silences, including U Ulysses Grant's omission of the Emancipation Proclamation in his recounting of the Civil War. McGrew then asks, at what point is it unreasonable for us, in the face of an avalanche of such examples, to retain our initial confidence regarding what auth ancient authors would have said? It's no wonder that, as the early 20th century Protestant theologian Charles Briggs said in reply to liberal scholars who use these arguments against the virgin birth that, quote, the argument from silence cannot be used as a nose of wax to prove anything you please, end quote. One way to answer arguments from silence is to show they prove too much. In 1924, J. Gresham Machen pointed out how liberal Christians were being inconsistent in denying the virgin birth simply because Paul did not explicitly teach the doctrine. He noted that, quote, the center of their religion is found in the ethical teaching of Jesus, especially in the golden rule. But where does Paul say anything about the golden rule? And where does he quote at any length the ethical teachings of Jesus, end quote? The same reply can be given to mythicists 
who crow about the dozens of ancient non-Christian historians who never mentioned Jesus Christ. Those same sources also don't mention the existence of Christians, but no one offers this as proof that Christians did not exist in the first century. The silence in these sources about Christ and Christians only proves that these pagan historians were either unaware of Jesus and his followers, or that they had little concern for what they probably considered to be myths or idle tales. That arguments from silence can prove too much is evident in arguments that Protestants make against the existence of a bishop of Rome in the first century. Protestant apologists say that because Ignatius of Antioch did not name the bishop of Rome or greet him in his letter to the Romans, such a person did not exist. Yet Ignatius also doesn't mention priests, deacons, or even any lay faithful by name in his letter to the Roman church. But that wouldn't prove that there were no Christians in Rome. What's more likely is that Ignatius, who is on his way to Rome to be executed, deliberately omits details about the Roman Christians in order to protect them from imperial persecution. In his other letters, Ignatius makes it clear that a local church is only valid if it has a bishop presiding over it. And so his effusive praise for the Church of Rome wouldn't make much sense if it lacked something that was necessary for it to be a valid church in the first place. And indeed, later sources, such as St. Irenaeus, who wrote just a few decades later, confirmed that there were bishops in Rome in the first century. Another way to answer arguments from silence is to show that the silence isn't scandalous. For example, it's true that Paul does not mention many aspects of Christ's earthly ministry. Neither do the sermons in the book of Acts. However, the author of Acts was clearly aware of Christ's earthly ministry, since he wrote the Gospel of Luke. Early Christians thought that Jesus' earthly ministry was important. But not every source chose to write about it directly. This also includes first century fathers like St. Clement of Rome, who allude, to the, who allude to the Gospels, but don't talk about specific elements of Jesus' earthly ministry. The Protestant scholar Michael Kruger points out that the apparent silences in some early Christian sources may not be intentional, but may be a result of texts being lost over the centuries. The fathers certainly weren't immune to this, as can be seen in works like Papias's five-volume exposition of the Logia of the Lord. It was written in the second century, but currently exists only as a few fragments that were cited by other authors. In this vein, Kruger gives another example from the New Testament that shows how arguments from silence can lead to rash conclusions. And, uh, quote, Think, for example, of Paul's discussion of Jesus instituting the Lord's Supper in 1 Corinthians 11, 23-26, a topic he never discusses anywhere else. Now, imagine for a moment that, for some reason, he didn't have first, we didn't have 1 Corinthians, we might conclude that Paul didn't know about Jesus instituting the Lord's Supper. Indeed, we might even conclude that Paul didn't believe in the institution of the Lord's Supper, and we would be flat out wrong. A Protestant might reply to skeptics that although the absence of details about Jesus' life in Paul or Clement may be odd, it is not a fatal objection to Christianity. We still have the canonical Gospels, to tell us about Jesus' earthly life and ministry. The silence in these cases relates merely to the question of why one source reports a fact whereas another one doesn't. But they might say in turn to Catholics, when it comes to dogmas like the Assumption of Mary, no source explicitly mentioned it, mentions it for several centuries after the birth of Christ. Even this modified standard for an argument from silence, however, can be used against important Christian doctrines. No church father mentions anything approaching a New Testament canon of Scripture until Irenaeus at the end of the second century, and his canon doesn't match the one we have today. As I noted earlier, the first complete description of the New Testament canon is, is not found in any source until the late 4th century.
What spurred the fathers to write on this subject were the second century Marcionite heretics who rejected several inspired books. According to Protestant scholar F.F. F. Bruce, quote, in the Marcionite controversy, an answer had to be given to the more fundamental question, what is the Bible? If they had not given much thought to the limits of Holy Writ previously, they had to pay serious attention to the question now, end quote. Baptist theologian Matthew Emerson cautions his fellow Protestants against reading too much into the silence of the fathers on a given subject, since they often focus on certain theological topics to the neglect of others. When we don't take this into account, he says, quote, historically this argument from patristic or medieval silence is an error of anachronism, end quote. Another reason to take Emerson's caution seriously is that some Protestant doctrines are absent, not just from the early church, but from nearly all of pre-Reformation history. When it comes to justification by faith alone, for instance, Geisler and Mackenzie admit that, quote, between the time of the Apostle Paul and the Reformers, scarcely anyone thought imputed righteousness or forensic justification. And that's assuming a certain interpretation of Paul. Otherwise, then it's just strictly a novel idea, uh, starting with Luther, uh, which um, Protestant uh, sc uh, Anglican scholar Alistair McGrath called a theological novum. Even Calvinist theologians who affirm this doctrine do not locate it prior to the 16th century. Some Protestants might be willing to grant that the pre-Reformation church did not teach important doctrines like forensic justification or eternal security, but since they believe in sola scriptura, the only thing that matters is whether the Bible teaches these doctrines, not whether any church fathers or anyone else in church history taught them. Emerson put it this way, quote, for Protestants, the ultimate doctrinal standard is not a particular period in church history or how early or late a particular doctrine is widely attested, but whether or not a particular doctrine is faithful to Holy Scripture. While we certainly want to pay attention to any belief's development, our assessment of it, if we are to be fully Protestant, should rest finally with whether or not it conforms to the word of God. And of course, uh, another way of approaching this same question, hey, consuls, welcome in, is anytime you hear people say this, always remember, and, and I'm responding directly to Emerson here, that it does matter um, what was taught in different periods of church history. It does matter how, um, what particular doctrines were widely attested because it's not, the, the doctrine itself is never presented in absence of scripture. The doctrine is being proposed as an explanation for what scripture teaches or for an interpretation of scripture. So the real question is, in the history of interpretation, um, when was the first time we have textual evidence somewhere in history where a particular interpretation of a passage appears? Because it's in that we would find the, expound, the expounding of particular doctrines. So, no, it doesn't really make any difference. So, basically what they're saying is it's not about these doctrines you see in church history. It's whether it conforms to the word of God. No, 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 no. You look at those things as being expressions of how they interpreted the word of God. Okay, there's, there's the distinction of what the word of God is objectively and then our attempts to grasp the meaning of that text and it's how we attempt to grasp the meaning of that text can lead us to different doctrinal conclusions which lead to doctrinal statements so it makes a lot of difference as to uh, William Webster's comment that 
the universal consent of the fathers taught baptismal regeneration. That's not a doctrine that they taught divorced from scriptures. If scripture never uh, mentions or says anything that could be remotely interpreted in that way, but rather that's how they interpreted the word of God. That's how they understood the word of God and took to be the word of God. So uh, I have to uh, be a little firm here on Emerson's conception. The F yeah, the FBI agents infiltrating churches. Uh, I've heard that several times uh, in uh, on the Michael Knowles show. He he talks about that sometimes. Uh, particularly the traditional Catholics. Oh, so dangerous are these people who want to go to the Latin Mass and worship Christ in the Eucharist and go to confession and live real holy lives. Um. The only thing I could possibly think of is that traditional Catholics are usually very, very conservative, which means they want to preserve church teaching. They don't play around with uh, heresy or heterodox ideas. Um, they're not interested in dissent or any of those kinds of things. And so the church... Um, Yes, yes, I think that the uh, the cross is a weapon in Castlevania. It kind of looks like a boomerang, but I think uh, most people think of it as a as a cross. Yeah, I just like the the whip is blessed by the church, and then the, of course the uh, the holy water, the the rosary that clears the screen. Yeah, there's there's all kinds of uh, stuff in uh, Castlevania that is uh, uh, Catholic. For sure, yeah. The stained glass windows. Uh, we see stained glass windows uh, in certain instances. Uh, now, this is a consistent position for a Protestant who only looks to the fathers for theological reflection and doesn't use their omissions as proofs and polemics against Catholicism. Both holding Emerson's attitude while also using the fathers to disprove Catholic doctrine amounts to a game of heads I win, tails you lose. Most Protestant arguments from silence in relation to the fathers seem to assume as a premise that if a doctrine were apostolic in origin, like the Assumption of Mary, then we'd expect the early fathers to have mentioned it. But if that claim were true, wouldn't it, wouldn't it prove that Protestant doctrines like eternal security or the denial of baptismal regeneration are not apostolic because the fathers either didn't mention them or even universally taught against them. A Protestant might say in response that because those doctrines can be found in Scripture, that is their interpretation of Scripture, uh, which seems in my opinion more suspect when you can't really find any evidence of anybody else ever interpreting Scripture in that way for like 1,500 years. That's kind of scary to me. A Protestant might say in response that because those doctrines can be found in Scripture, they are apostolic, even if they aren't explicit in the early fathers, but they, uh, but are they found in Scripture, or are they found in certain interpretations of Scripture? If these major doctrines about how salvation is gained or lost were in Scripture, then it would be highly unusual for the majority or in some cases the entirety of pre-Reformation Christians to fail to notice them. Yeah, um, obviously I'm, I'm Catholic for a reason. That's something that still baffles me. Traditional values and such are now the new edgy and rebellious. Ooh, I know, right? Oh no, they went to church and they're against abortion. That's so terrible. I know it's weird. It's 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 really really weird, in my mind that people want to conceptualize a right as someone being able to do anything that they want despite other people. Now, at its core. The idea of the right to life is the most fundamental right because all the other rights can't exist um, without actually being alive. See, 
what I think it's quite clear that as soon as something is living, it has a right to life. As soon as it's living, it has a right to life. That that's I mean, something has to be alive in order for it to have a right to life. Um because of something that's not living, certainly nothing really could be said of something that doesn't exist. But once something is living, because it's living, it has a right to that life. And the difficulty here is, is yes, it has to do with the woman's body. It certainly does. It also has to do with the new life like, right, the new life that is growing within her with unique DNA and uh, eventually starts growing fingers and everything else. You have a human being uh, in embryonic form and then an infant form and then child form and then adult form and then so on and so forth. And um, whatever form that a human being takes, it, it's still living. And it's living as an ontological category, as something specific. It's not a frog. It's not, it's not living as a frog. It's not living as a dog or an amoeba or something. Uh, it's, it's human nature, right? It's human nature to exist first in embryonic form. It is human nature to exist in a more developed uh, you know, child form and so on and so forth. The thing is, the stress ought to be on just how precious and important human reproduction actually is. It's incredibly important. Um, and the problem is we have a culture that treats sex so frivolously, uh, doesn't take it. Um, it's not precious anymore. It's, it's done after going to the bar, you know, and uh, people have multiple... Um, partners and you know they go to tinder and just keep swiping right and so on and so forth and um, when the day is done is that once uh, human sexuality was taken outside of the context of reproduction responsibility virtue um, then it becomes this thing that, well, we should be able to just do this thing. We should just be able to titillate our passions and give into our um, uh, basis inclinations. And whatever consequence that comes from that, we should be able to eliminate immediately and just do whatever we want. And uh, in the words of uh, Pope Paul VI in his ecumenical document, uh, ecumenical no, no, not a uh, ecumenical document. Uh, papal encyclical Humanae Vitae. It's it's separating the unitive, the procreative principle f from the unitive um, within the conjugal act. What's very interesting and beautiful is that when one really grasps the proper place of human sexuality within marriage, once properly defined, um, that is geared towards the, the uh, procreation and education of children, then what we, what we find is that when marriage is properly defined, sex is properly understood, and its role and its responsibility um, within the context of uh, childbearing and uh, raising children and responsibility. Uh, our culture wants to divorce all of those things. It, it wants all the fun. It wants all the pleasure. It doesn't want any other responsibilities. And we can't really separate all those things without severe con uh, moral consequences to ourselves, right? So, yeah, life begins at the moment of conception. Yeah, as, as soon as you have uh, the egg and sperm coming together, you have a unique uh, DNA strand that begins cellular uh, um, division uh, immediately. Uh, like within just a few days, you, you you'll within a week, you'll have what is called a blastocyst, which has all the cellular and um, inf uh, material and uh, um, genetic information in order to begin the process of 
um, cellular differentiation and so on and so forth. It's, it's, it's a life. As soon as you have cellular division, you, you have a life. Something capable of cellular division is something that's living. You remember in biology class, uh, something was living because it, it grows, uh, it moves, it uh, consumes. There's all this language that was used. How do you differentiate uh, like an inanimate object like a rock? from actual living material. And, and it was very simple. It's just those things that I said. And all those things can be said of a zygote. It, it's, it's living. Okay, now that it's living, we have a responsibility to it, to allow nature to do what nature does in, 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 this, in this process. It's living and it's unique. Uh, as such, we have a responsibility. It has a right to the life that it now has. And it just makes me sick that people just want to say, well, it doesn't have memories, it doesn't have consciousness, it doesn't have knowledge, and this, that, and everything else. And I'm like, none of those things are necessarily proper to a human at every form, at, at every stage of its development. Uh, particularly in um, Catholic theology, we believe that at the moment of conception, God creates a unique human soul. So whether or not there's a brain there for brain activity, it has already been endowed with an intellect. It has already been endowed with will. Because uh, and it's proper that the body would uh, grow to accompany those activities of the soul, those powers of the soul because the soul is the, subst the substantive form of the body. Once somebody really grasps all of those things, um, it, it makes a lot of sense. It, 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 it really does. The only thing that people would want to try to change about all of that is once, I, once again is, okay, you did this thing and guess what? Now you have to resp be responsible. It's time to grow up. You're not going to kill it for out of convenience or fear or something like that. No, uh, you be bold. You 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 take care of the life you've created because you did that thing that creates life. Now you're responsible to it. Even science proves it. Once that unique makeup of cells is destroyed, that person is killed. Yes. All beings produce of their own kind. An expecting mother isn't having a fish or a house plant. Yep. So wasn't the '60s known as free love? Yeah, I, I think so. I've I've heard something like that. Kills 99% of Lysol. Kills 99% of virus and bacteria. Lysol is against right to life. <laughs> Well, I think rights, um, it, it doesn't have to do with, uh, say, uh, those, uh, like, like, for example, when it says in the Declaration of Independence that we have been endowed by our Creator, right, with una unalienable rights. Uh, it is proper to humans to have such rights because God endowed them. Um, uh, and it's part of our nature. It's not part of the nature of, say, a virus or a bacteria. Um, they're not creating the image and likeness of God. They're not hylomorphic. Um, um, they, they don't have an intellect. They don't have a will. They're not persons. And so um, the idea of uh, a right has to do with we have the right to do what is right. We have a right to exercise the, the, those, uh, the, the capacity which God has given to us. And uh, there are no such capacity within viruses and bacteria. And they are not um, ontologically uh, capable of being anything more than what they already are. They're not, um, they're, they're not, for instance, uh, an earlier stage of an organism that uh, will and can uh, take on uh, uh, an immortal soul. 
Uh, I was having an argument with a bunch of pro-abortion people on the internet once. A girl chimed in and said, it's immoral to force a woman against her will. See, see, that's, that's the problem. Force a woman against her will. Uh, other, other than in the case of rape, when conception is forced upon a woman, um, every woman participates in the reproductive act. And when a woman participates in the reproductive act, reproduces as a result of it, uh, she is therefore responsible to care for her child, not to kill it. And so this whole idea of forcing, it's, it's, it's kind of like uh, telling a mother, yeah, you can't tell a mother to for, you can't force a mother to feed her infant. Like, what? You're a mother. By nature, you feed your infant, uh, particularly from your own body, if, if you're capable of doing so. Uh, it's part of our nature, and I, it's part of owning our nature, and being what we are. You know, uh, when, when, we, when a woman, uh, when a girl recognizes that, okay, of this human population, it's a sexually dimorphic species. Um, I am the female component of this species, and this is what the uh, reproductive and biological function of the female uh, in this species does. And so uh, one needs to own that and take responsibility for it. So it's a very interesting expression when, when people say force. It's like saying uh, it's immoral to force a woman to feed her infant so that her infant won't die. It's, it's, it's a really weird language for someone to even go there conceptually. It's strange. Yeah. Uh, to give birth to something that is not alive. To not alive, of course it's alive. Wow. I pulled up a link to a third grade level biology page of what makes something alive. The argument ended. Of course it would. Most people just want the convenience. Advocating abortion always requires you to arbitrarily draw a line, whether it's murder or just fine. Even if you get the line slightly off, you're advocating for murder. Don't need religion to advocate against it. Yeah, in fact, uh, most of what um, I've, I've said concerning the uh, being aware of nature. Right? <laughs> Cat food, that's funny. Um, being aware of our nature in our place in the biological ecosystem. Looking, at, like, like I said, what is our biological function given what we are? We're not dogs, we're not cats, we're not turtles, we're, we're, we're not fish that are hermaphroditic you know, that can change and reproduce. And there's, there's different things in nature and they function according to their nature. Uh, our nature, however, we're sexually dimorphic. There's a male and female component. Uh, that is our biological function for reproduction. That's how we reproduce. Um, when we use the term sex, it's just referring to uh, those two components coming together uh, for the process of reproduction. We don't reproduce asexually, for instance. So, um, and sometimes I even get, um, I, I would prefer that people not refer to all activity that involves a genital uh, as uh, sexual per se, because technically something is sexual because it's part of sexual reproduction. That's when we, that's the context in which we use that word. And so uh, it, uh, along that line then is uh, there's complementarity between the two components, right? There's genital complementarity, there's functional compatibility. Uh, 
in, uh, in, in what is by nature the function of our organs. But taking the organ outside of that context makes it a perverse genital act that's not proper to the end for which we clearly see it in our nature. We start to abuse and misuse our nature. We start to utilize in our, bo our body in a way that's not um, the, the purpose uh, for it. Um, so there's quite a few perverse things that people can uh, end up engaging in. Uh, once again, not really understanding and accepting our nature, people aren't really interested in discovering our nature and understanding our nature. They want to craft reality uh, with whatever ideas that they want to have, uh, particularly live a certain way, all right, and then craft a worldview that says it's okay. Uh, so a lot of times people's ethics are an after, afterthought. This is how they live. We justify these things. And then we craft a worldview that says, you know, I'm a decent person. Because who goes out of their way to be like, man, I'm gross. I'm doing all these weird, strange sex stuff. <laughs> I, I, most people aren't going out of their way to convince themselves of that. Uh, rather, they're uh, justifying their acts. Uh, in fact, I, I, I've had conversations with people who said uh, that they used to feel shame for certain things that they did. But then they told themselves, no, there's nothing wrong with it. They pushed through and they, they, they kept doing it until they didn't feel the shame anymore. And uh, they, they, the, the, this person, he, he made this argument that uh, that's basically what you have to do. You have to just push through and just do the thing that you want to do. And eventually, and, and I said, you know what scripture calls that? He calls that having a calloused conscience. It, it, Paul uses the language of as if the conscience has been seared as with a red hot iron. It's now calloused. You don't even feel the shame of your shameful acts anymore. And the thing is, is when we do something perverse, it is natural for us to feel shame. Right? It, it should be something that, that gives us pause and redirects our behavior. Um, and in fact, if we find ourselves continually giving ourselves over to shameful behavior, um, we might need help, psychological help. Uh, it, there could be other things that are going on because we're now misusing our nature. Our nature has a very particular teleos about it. Uh, our actions are to be in accord with nature directed towards their natural end. And when they're not, we're just misusing our body. Um, we're, we might be acting like some other animal, but we're definitely not acting like us. In fact, we're, we're acting, uh, uh, engaging in kind of like non-human, subhuman kind of behaviors uh, because it's not in accord with our design, our nature, with our dignity. Abortion wins the emotional argument, but I find, well, I don't know about that because, I mean, there have been people who have been shown what a, what a child being dismembered and pulled out limb by limb from the, 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 the mother's womb and, and had an emotional response to it and said, nope, nope, now I know exactly what it is. It's, it's horrific. So I don't really know if it's, I, I think what you mean by emotional, I think you mean like sympathy for a person who is now a mother. A pregnant woman is now a mother, no matter how old she is. She's a mother now. And she will continue to be a mother, even if she decides to kill her child. She'll just be a mother with a dead child 
which is much worse. And whether or not they're not ready for it or, or whatnot, that's why we need to help each other. This is why there's sometimes parents will have the daughter live in their home and they'll help raise the kid and so on and so forth. Might not be what the parents want to do, but guess what? There's a new life. You have a grandchild now. You're, you're a grandpa. You're a grandma. Live up to the name. Be heroic. You find the pro-life people I know have thought about it more and confronted the uncomfortable parts. Yeah, that's true. Uh, it's a cope. <laughs> uh, you talking about fights? <laughs> that's funny, Consul. shouldn't all fall on the mothers and we let the men who don't step up off the hook way too much yeah you know it uh, I, I was talking about yesterday how some men abandon their families or I mean, there was this there was this video of this guy he may have been on tiktok or something he was talking about how he had like five kids from like five different women and um He's like, I didn't want those kids. I, you know, it's absolutely, and I'm like, dude, you engaged in the act of reproduction with these women. You reproduced with these women. The fruit of that act is there. And he's like, I want, I didn't want them to keep them. I wanted them to, to, to kill them. They're the ones that decided to keep them. I didn't want them. I'm not going to do anything with them. I'm like, dude. I mean, like back in the day, that that that's where your brothers and your dad take you out behind the shed, and they treat you like a man who has failed miserably. I suppose there's something to be said for discipline. It's just an expression. Do do I think it's super effective? Uh, I don't know. Depends on the person's uh, personality, I suppose. Yeah, there is something to be said for spanking. Spare the rod, spoil the child, you know. There are different forms of uh, punishment. Negative reinforcement um, can certainly be used, as well as uh, positive reinforcements. I think sometimes our culture gets it wrong, and... Uh, Say it's wrong to spank your child, squelches their personality. And, uh, um, no, I mean, you, you can't always reason with a two year old. Sometimes a swat on the butt gets their attention. Yeah. So, yeah, I absolutely know exactly what you mean. Like, men need to step up, they need to help raise the child. They need to be responsible because guess what? They're a father now. They need to start fathering. They need to start learning how to be a father because that's what they are. So they need to decide, are they going to be a, de a deadbeat dad? Or are they going to be a rock star? Who do you want to be? Yeah. All right, we're almost done with this reading. Obviously, more could be said about which arguments from silence in relation to ancient, document, uh, ancient doctrine are plausible and which are flimsy. The key for us is not to use arguments from silence indiscriminately. Our Lord's advice in the Sermon on the Mount applies in this case. The measure you give will be the measure you get. That's why I've stopped using certain arguments from silence against Protestantism, or at least rhetorical flourishes that have the same purpose. For example, in the past, I've asked Protestants, quote, which church father would you be comfortable having as a pastor in your church? Or which church father holds to your theology? The goal of the question was to make an implicit argument that silence from silence to show that Protestantism is unhistorical and thus not apostolic in origin, 
But I've since realized that these questions aren't helpful because they can be turned against Catholics. For example, I would love to, ha to have St. Thomas Aquinas as a pastor at my church, but he denied the traditional teaching of on the Immaculate Conception. You know, it's interesting. I, I, I wonder what this means because I, I remember listening to... Uh, Oh, what was his name? Uh, his name was uh, John Selva. He 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 made an argument one time in a dialogue with Matt Frad that it was his opinion that maybe this was not the case, but it's it's not clear exactly what here is is meant. This doesn't show that Aquinas wasn't Catholic, since that doctrine would not be formally defined for another 600 years, which is also an important point to note. But it does show that one can claim a saint or father as a spiritual ancestor, even if they don't share every facet of one's current theology. But, of course, in this case, Thomas Aquinas would be uh, super, 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 super Catholic. And if Thomas Aquinas came to our church, well, I'm sure he'd catch up with all of the teachings of the church and doctrinal development and so on and so forth, and uh, would have no problem being a faithful child of the church as he was in his own day. Uh, I, I, I kind of still think the, the, the question that he used to ask Protestants are thought-provoking to some extent. I think he, he sells his, these arguments uh, a little too short because they're thought experiments. These are thought experiments. And uh, I, I think uh, that there could be some value there. But it, does, but it does show that one can claim a saint. Okay, so If we allow for Catholic doctrine to have developed over time and still to have maintained continuity, with the apostles, then we should be courteous to Protestants who attempt a similar explanation for the presence of their beliefs in church history. So, in the, in this case, obviously, like with uh, the um, uh, with the dogma of the Immaculate Conception, for instance, which isn't referring to the Virgin Birth; it's talking about uh, Mary being conceived in the womb of Saint Anne, that God prepared Mary from the first moment of her conception, granting her grace in virtue of the anticipation of the uh, the redemption, uh, which will uh, be born uh, through her, and. Uh, prepare her to, for, for God to dwell within her in a much more fitting way, the theologically speaking, um, that she was conceived uh, with sanctifying grace. Uh, so with that said, is that definition came much later. It doesn't mean that it wasn't believed prior. It just means that when cert throughout church history, when certain questions arose concerning a point of doctrine, uh, the church would come to an answer on it. Uh, then they would teach definitively, and then uh, they would define the doctrine clearly, and then the church would be bound to those definitions, and it would settle the matter. Rome has spoken. Uh, it is at an end. Now, in terms of doctrinal development, this certainly isn't the kind of thing that I've ever heard a Protestant claim for themselves that, oh, we believe in Sola Scriptura because of doctrinal development. I've never heard that kind of argument. I've, I've never heard someone say, I, I believe that we are justified by faith alone in terms of um, the mere imputation of righteousness, of Christ's alien righteousness, 
is the res is the product of doctrinal development, which then they proceed to demonstrate from early church sources, showing how in the second, third, fourth, fifth century, how Christians have made more explicit those things which they believed implicitly and uh, expounded upon those things which were um, uh, implications of teaching which they already held to be true. I've, ne I've never heard a Protestant uh, formulate an argument in that way, so um, I'm not quite sure. I, I think Trent maybe was just trying to be fair to that uh, let's be more refined in our thinking. It doesn't make much sense for us to oversimplify an issue because often by making blanket statements, uh, we are uh, trying to say too much too fast and uh, making too many generalizations. Uh, we, we we're actually blanketing uh, potential ignorance on on our own part because often these cases are much more uh, refined. Uh, there's a lot of subtleties and intricacies uh, distinctions to be made and uh, um, there are nuances that need to be uh, explored and I, I think only then you know we're giving due intellectual uh, you know, um, assent to um, to what we actually believe and what we profess and wish to proclaim to others. So uh, it was a good reading. We also had a really good talk about uh, abortion and responsibility and things like this. So thanks for hanging out, everybody. It's uh, time for me to get going. Uh, God bless, and uh, we'll see each and every one of you again in the future. So have a wonderful night.